This is our um, second month online for breakfasts, uh, the Watershed Alliance. I'm going to start chatting here. The uh, Hudson River Watershed Alliance has been um, doing uh, or hosting breakfasts uh, now since about 2007. Uh, we've traditionally met at the, the Plaza Diner in New Paltz, uh, which was a somewhat central location accessible via the three-way and accessible to Region 3 DEC offices and people from Dutchess County could pop across the bridge. It was a, it was a good location. Um, and uh, we would all order our own breakfasts, sit together, break bread, eggs, and, um, and, and uh, have, a, have somebody lined up to give a good talk. Um, and so we're, we're exploring that model now online. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the normal f model is that we end right on time. So um, we will end at 9.30. Um, I'm gonna ask Emily to speak briefly here. She's got a couple Watershed Alliance announcements. Yeah, hi everyone. Good morning and, and welcome to our modified breakfast lecture here uh, via Zoom. I just wanted to mention um, Carol Roper has passed away and, and recognize and remember Carol. She was a longtime breakfast lecture attendee and she had considerable community service in New Paltz that, that she was really known for. So I wanted to, to just take a moment and recognize and remember Carol. Uh, she'll certainly be missed here by the Hudson River Watershed Alliance community as well as the New Paltz community. So I just uh, wanted to say that just just to start and start on sort of a somber note. Um, I also wanted to recognize the Hudson River Watershed Alliance board members who are on our Zoom webinar today. We've got Mary McNamara, Nicole Liable, Phil Degatano, and Kate Meyerdertz, and maybe a few others who uh, I haven't noticed yet, but uh, thank you to the Hudson River Watershed Alliance board and thank you for joining us this morning. I also wanted to mention that the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is holding our annual awards benefit as a live stream event since we can't meet together in person. So the Toast to the Tribs will be on Tuesday, June 2nd as a live stream at 7 p.m. And you can register and get more information on our website. Uh, we'll be recognizing four Watershed Wave Maker awardees that include Peter Smith from the Passaic Creek Watershed Alliance. And I saw that Peter is on the webinar this morning. We'll be recognizing the Upper Hudson Watershed Coalition, the Albany Water Department, and Hudson River Sloop Clearwater for all their work in the watershed. So sign up for the Toast to the Tribs on our website. Uh, it's available as a live stream. We uh, encourage donations, but we want it to be available to anyone who wants to tune in and watch. Thank you, Emily. Um, we've perhaps been remiss and with introductions. Emily uh, Vale is the executive director of the Watershed Alliance, and um, I'm Russell Urban Mead. Uh, until uh, last December, was on the the board of the Watershed Alliance, and have delighted to continue volunteering to uh, organize these breakfasts. So um, let's see. Uh, I think we are. Enrollees have kind of stabilized for the morning here, so we're going to introduce our speaker. We're delighted to have Tim Koch here today. Um, you all know from the promo material, but just to say it briefly, um, Tim attended SUNY ESF, uh, has a master's degree in um, watershed hydrology and, and, bi and uh, biochemistry, um, and is currently working at um, the um, Cornell Crop of Extension Ulster County, uh, sponsored by the, um, and working on, on stream programs, uh, developing uh, science-based education and stream process to uh, municipal uh, officials and residents in the Ashokan Reservoir watershed. Uh, delighted to have Tim here today. Uh, Tim, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're gonna turn this over to you. The time is yours until uh, 9.30. Uh, shortly before 9.30, for those of you um, attending, uh, Emily will read off any questions that you post in the, the chat um, column. So if, as you go along, you have questions, please post your questions there. Emily will then field them to Tim uh, in the remaining moments of our session. 
Um, Tim, thank you very much, and the time is yours, and uh, welcome okay. to the breakfast. Well, thank you very much, Russell and Emily, and um, I'm very glad to be here. Let's see if I can get this working. <clears throat> Okay, so yes, um, Russell, Emily, thank you again, and thank you everybody for joining, and I hope you enjoy your breakfast as you hear a little bit about why messy streams are healthy streams. And so uh, very quickly, just talking about the Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program. Uh, the AWSMP is a collaboration between Cornell Cooperative, who uh, I work for, Ulster County, as well as the Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District and the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And they are the primary funder of the program. And so those three agencies, we all work together collaboratively to try to maintain and improve stream health in the Ashokan Reservoir watershed, uh, which you can see here. 450 miles of streams, uh, it's a 255 square mile watershed, with about 95% of that uh, being forested. And as you can see, so we work with five different town governments. We have a number of different hamlets and villages and population centers. And uh, ultimately, all this water gets to the reservoir, which provides about 40% of New York City's daily water use needs, which currently, if I remember correctly, is about 9 million people using just over 1 billion gallons of water a day. So pretty, pretty massive system that we are just uh, one part of. Uh, so, before we go forward, I do want to sort of give credit where credit's due. I, I didn't, I was very limited in my time at the, uh, at the conference last October, so I didn't get to give as much credit as I'd like to, uh, but I would like to call out the work of Dr. Ellen Wall. Um, this talk, the, the name of the talk, and a lot of what I'm going to be speaking about uh, is based around her work, and she's out of Colorado State University and has done a lot of work around this idea of messy streams and, and how that relates to the health of these streams. Also a lot of work around uh, in-channel wood, you know, wood management in stream channels. And we're gonna talk about this again later in, in detail, but this is a really great paper. I recommend everybody read it. Uh, the AWSMP brought Dr. Wall out in 2016, shortly after this was published, uh, to present this framework to our stream access and recreation working group. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but since that talk that the group has uh, approved this framework as a way to manage wood in the watershed. And we've been implementing it since about 2017, 2018. And so we'll go, we'll go through that uh, much later, but did want to call out the work of, of Dr. Wall here. So for folks that were at the Alliance's annual conference in October. Um, you know, this might look a little familiar, but I had 15 minutes then and I have about 40 minutes today. So uh, it's not gonna be a repeat of the same presentation. I got a lot of questions after the conference talk. And so I was able to really go in and expand on those areas where I got a lot of questions. So hopefully it'll be different, um, not a rerun. But what we're gonna do is we'll start out talking about just healthy streams and messy streams, what they are, um, where we get messiness in streams and, and variety in stream systems and what that means, the implications of that. We're gonna get into some pretty hard sort of stream science there, but then we'll back off a little bit and we'll look at this idea of a, of a baseline of perception. And when we think about streams, whether it be healthy or messy streams, you know, what is our baseline? What are we considering, considering normal what are we considering natural when it comes to streams? And where is that baseline? And then we'll sort of reconcile those two things, what the science is telling us and, and sort of what our gut is telling us. And those don't often agree or don't always agree, I should say, and that creates some challenges to responsible stream management. And we'll end with bringing that all together and, and how can we take this science and how can we take these gut feelings about streams how do we put them together and, and get to a place where uh, we are using the best stream management that we can that works with the natural tendencies of streams. So to start out with healthy streams, you know, if you say healthy streams, probably almost everybody jumps right to chemical water quality. 
you know, you can look at the impaired water body list, the 303D list, are, are these streams meeting their designated uses? Another way to look at stream health is a little bit more integrated by looking at the biology, especially the benthic biota, the macroinvertebrates, and using that as a barometer to look at stream health. And in our program, we really emphasize this idea of geomorphic channel stability. And it, a stream really needs to be geomorphically stable to be healthy as well. And um, so it's not only just water quality. And I'll take this opportunity to shamelessly promote myself in that I recently uh, posted a video on our YouTube that goes into geomorphic sta channel stability and defines it um, in hopefully easy to digest terms. So it's about a nine minute video and it's really, hopefully it's a good introduction to fluvial geomorphology and what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about geomorphic channel stability. When we were testing out the links this morning, uh, it doesn't seem like you folks will be able to click these or even copy the text. Um, so hopefully at the end, I can put in uh, these links into the chat or somebody can put the links in um, so that you can access. You, you can see my stability video here, but I also do want to promote uh, some other work of my colleagues in the program that are posting videos as well, especially our youth educator, Matt Savacki, and our program assistant, Amanda Cabanillas, who are putting up tons of videos for youth and have these really cool activities that you can do and you can follow along um, with the kids, talking about stream cross sections and assessing culverts and, and a whole bunch of different videos. And, and we're putting stuff up uh, pretty regularly here in our social distancing quarantine phase. So, you know, please check that out. Some really great materials there. And so moving forward, uh, you know, I don't think many people would argue that these look like two healthy streams here. All the photos you'll see, I think all the photos, uh, come from the Ashokan watershed. So it's a pretty local talk. Uh, like I said, it's a lot of this is based on Dr. Wall's work but sort of localized here within the watershed and within you know, upstate New York in general. So we've got the Esopus Creek and the Little Beaver Kill. They, they look like beautiful, healthy streams. But when we start getting into some of these other streams, um, you know, it, it's not quite as clear, I don't think. And, and I do encourage you to sort of step out of your, your uh, pro-river bias and, you know, all the experience you have with rivers and streams and, and think about someone in the general public seeing this picture and what they might think about this stream and is it healthy or is it messy and, and how those two things relate to each other. So this is a picture of the Esopus after a flood back in 2005, and, but it's a, it's a good picture to sort of talk about these three main things that we're going to be talking about today in, in this idea of messiness in streams. So we're talking about depositional areas uh, where we're getting sediment deposition and depositional bars. And perhaps that's even to the extent where we're starting to get multi-thread channels. And a, a big thing we're going to talk about today is this large woody material in streams. Um, you know, a lot of that's a, it can really look messy really quickly and, um, so these three things together, you know, are going to be our main sort of messy features that we're going to talk about. And these are also features that introduce this idea of physical complexity. So we'll use that term a little bit. Synonymous with this idea of messiness. So, you know, where do we get variety and complexity and messiness in streams? You know, water flows downhill, but probably most of us here know that it, it doesn't do it evenly. It kind of does it in fits and spurts. But when you look under the surface of the water, that you start to see even more complexity. And so in terms of where we're seeing, where we're getting complexity in streams, the, the first place is the stream itself in the, in the bed. And you can see this relationship between the bed and the water surface. And, you know, we do have areas of adverse slope in these glides here where, you know, technically the water kind of is flowing uphill. That's going to create a lot of dynamics with sediment distribution and sediment sizes. Same thing with organic material. And again, adding wood into, a, into this system would have a pretty big impact on these bed forms. So wood that's sort of uh, interacting with the stream bed 
has a big source of complexity and variety. Similar to the bed, you know, we're going to get some complexity in the banks as well. And just like pretty much everything else dealing with stream banks, that's largely controlled by vegetation. So here in Dry Brook, you know, we see this uh, riparian tree with these nice woody roots really holding some of this sediment in place. And, you know, you're, you're getting a little bit of undulation in the stream bank and what, what's called these embayments here. And so even in this one picture, which is a pretty small or high resolution, I guess, we're looking at a relatively small area, there's a lot of variety in the hydraulics you're seeing. So a riffle feature here, but then because of this protruding bank, we're getting what's called a lateral protrusion pool here on the downstream side, which is creating a completely different hydraulic environment. So we're getting a lot of variation in the stream from the banks. The cross-sectional form as well, you know, as you're moving down a stream between riffles and pools, you know, you're getting a lot of different cross-sections based on where you are relative to the meanders. And again, uh, substrate resistance. So put in a, a large roughness element like a boulder or again, like a, a tree trunk that sort of gets lodged somewhere in one of these cross-sections, it's going to have a big influence. So we can really start to see how, how wood really can impact a stream in, in many different ways. And uh, the last sort of thing here is like the plan form. When you look at a stream from above, you can really get an idea of the complexity. This gets a lot into the valley shape. You know, the, the shape of the valley and the geomorphology of the valley is really gonna manifest itself in, in the stream and what you're seeing there. So here in the beaver kill, this is an area where the, the the slope really flattens out, the valley gets really wide, and you can see that that introduces a lot of complexity that you don't see further up in the beaver kill in the steeper, straighter reaches. So we're seeing things like oxbow lakes and old abandoned channels that get reactivated during high flows, shoot cutoff channels. You can really start to see that as a, as a system, streams can be very complex. Uh, if you zoom out from the channel. So a number of different ways that we introduce variety and complexity in a stream channel, but what does it all mean? So, you know, what are the implications of this? Well, the first one is that when you get a diverse channel like that with diverse bed forms and, and deep pools and shallow steep riffles, you know, you're, you're creating diverse habitat and that diverse habitat invites diverse species you know, getting us to that um, goal of improving or at least maintaining biodiversity. I will admit I am not an angler in any sense. Uh, I've got a few people that are trying to, to teach me a little bit because um, it's a whole nother way to view a river. But I, I did a quick Google search, you know, where do you find trout in streams and found these couple images here. And, you know, you, you find trout in the messy spots. And in here, uh, you see this this boulder, you know, this idea of substrate resistance. Again, we're seeing this lateral protrusion pool on the downstream side, and it's a great spot for trout to hang out. Similar to the deep pools that we're seeing, that, that variety in the stream bed. And then again, wood, wood and boulders, these, these things that look messy in a stream tend to be, you know, these, these things that are improving the habitat diversity of the system. Another great benefit of messiness in streams is connectivity. And another thing that we're always shooting to at least maintain, if not improve in environmental sciences. And um, so here's a debris jam in Broad Street Hollow. And the backwater effect that we're getting from this accumulation is increasing this channel floodplain connectivity. It's also increasing the channel hyporic zone connectivity. The hyporic zone being this area directly under the stream bed. And what happens here is you get this mixing of groundwater and surface water. These two sources of water have very different uh, biogeochemistry, different levels of dissolved nutrients and dissolved oxygen. And so this area of interaction between these two is very important uh, for the ecosystem, nutrient cycling and, and all this throughout the entire stream. We're also getting an upstream downstream connection. And now some people might say, well, you know, is this is a big accumulation, and is this a barrier to aquatic migration? And ultimately, ultimately it's not. Uh, you know, our native trout here, the brook trout, 
has co-evolved with beavers. And it's been shown that, that trout can move through a beaver dam. And a, you know, a standard wood accumulation like this is, is probably going to be even more porous than a beaver dam. So you know, really fish are not gonna have much of a problem getting up here. The connectivity improvement that we're seeing is, you know, this wood accumulation is creating a very unique feature here. This Broad Street Hollow is a pretty steep sort of cascading step pool system. And here we're getting this very large, deep pool. A lot of fine sediment and organic matter is accumulating. And that's going to be inviting species from upstream or downstream to come to this area as a place of refuge or, or spawning or rearing grounds. And so we're getting this upstream downstream connection from this wood accumulation here. Uh, we're getting retention because of especially log jams and, uh, and accumulations here. So this picture is uh, one of the headwater streams of the Esopus Creek. It's a, a high transport, high energy reach where, and it's typically a bedrock reach. But what we're seeing here is that this accumulation of woody material is, is holding some of this material back. It's holding some of this water back which is helping to reduce the flood wave downstream during high flow events. Holding back the sediment, you know, we see a, a gravel bar here, but mixed in there is a lot of fine sediment that potentially has things like phosphorus adsorbed to it. And so in this steep, otherwise, you know, a little oligotrophic system, we're holding back some of these nutrients, making them bioavailable for a little bit longer and making available to the ecosystem, to plants and animals for, for uptake. So we're seeing a lot of retention here because of this, this messiness. Geomorphic stability again, this is a big part of our program. And so what we're gonna see here is Lost Clove. Again, this is another steep headwater tributary to the Esopus. And here we're looking downstream. And what you see here is, is an actively incising stream. It's degrading, uh, the elevation of the bed is sort of decreasing. And, and the big concern is we're at risk of losing floodplain connection here. Uh, you can see these very these steep high banks sort of on both sides here. And, and that's a result of this incision, a uh, head cut migrating up the valley. If we turn from this exact location and look upstream, this is what we see. And uh, I hope, depending on where your gallery view is here, you might want to move it um, because you want to get a good picture here of what you see upstream. But ultimately, we're seeing a, a, a log and a wood accumulation that's halting the upstream migration of this head cut. So if you compare upstream, you know, you see this nice, easily accessible floodplain compared to downstream where we're getting these high banks. And so again, this is a, a head cut migrating upstream and it's being halted, you know, it's probably not gonna be stopped, but it's at least being slowed by this wood accumulation here. And so, you know, we're getting different hydraulics upstream and downstream and ulti ultimately a, a healthier stream, a more geomorphically stable stream uh, upstream of the wood here. So it's providing a really great benefit for the stability of the stream. And again, that works on the hill slopes as well. Here we see evidence of an old hill slope failure that was uh, triggered because of erosion of those, the sediment at the toe of the slope. That destabilized the hill slope and you get mass wasting of the material. Up until we get this you know, log that has come down, sort of implanted itself parallel to the flow, that's trapped other material that's coming down and ultimately stopped the, the entrainment of the, those toe sediments. That has thus allowed this material to sort of stabilize, uh, you know, and it's allowed vegetation to come in, and that's going to just further stabilize this area and ultimately cut this off as a source of sediment to the stream. Um, so if you were to remove this wood, you know, you'd likely initi reinitiate this hill slope failure, and that'd be another source of sediment to the stream. So, a lot of benefits in terms of uh, the geomorphic stability here. <clears throat> now, for anyone that did see this talk at the uh, annual conference last October, I got a lot of questions about this next bit. So I'm really going to expand on this here. Um, 
again, we're going to talk a lot about this, this geomorphic stability, that variety that we're seeing because of that with those bed forms, and how that's going to decrease the sensitivity and increase the resilience of these systems. So, you know, sensitivity is obviously how sensitive a system is to disturbance, and the resilience is how quickly that system can bounce back after a disturbance. So we're going to look at two different types of streams. Uh, first, this C stream type, which is, you know, your, your quintessential meandering river with point bars and cut banks on the outside, nice wide floodplains, and your standard riffle pool system. We're going to compare that to an F channel, which a lot of people think is sort of just across the board, an unstable channel. And that's not exactly true. Uh, I was actually out in the field yesterday with Danny Davis from the DEP, and, and we were looking at what was essentially an F channel, and it was beautiful. Uh, but, you know, in, in certain circumstances, these, these Fs are, are definitely unstable, and we're going to uh, use those circumstances to talk about this. But ultimately, you can see that it's an entrenched stream. You don't have this nice floodplain access. And a lot of times in the sort of unstable variety of the F channel, during sub-bankful flows, it's obvious, it's, it's uh, oftentimes this sort of shallow, like almost sheet flow that you're seeing in, a, in an F channel. It's overly widened. So it's not providing a lot of nice deep pools where fish can, can hold, uh, and you're not getting a lot of good sediment transport. And so what we're gonna do here is compare these two streams. We'll say that we have two streams, a C and an F, both with a bankful discharge of about 350 CFS. And we're gonna compare what's called the unit stream power. You can think of unit stream power basically as the sediment transportability of the stream. You know, how much power does the stream have to, to one, erode, but then also transport sediment? And we can see here, so as, as discharge increases up to a bankful flow, we can see that we're having the C channel has more stream power. And that comes back to this idea of that the depth, you know, a, a nice inner berm feature within the channel that allows for sediment transport at, at bankful and below flows. But once we get above bankful into flood stages, we see a very different, you know, uh, relationship between these two streams. And you know, in my talk in October, this is basically where we ended it, but, and I got a lot of questions about this, so we're gonna dig a little deeper into the science here. And so we'll, we'll look at unit stream power and what it is, and it's basically shear stress times the mean velocity. And shear stress in its sort of simple form can be thought of as a depth slope product. So, you know, this unit stream power over here in its simplified form, is the depth of the, the channel times the slope times the velocity. So now in our F channel here, once we get into our flood flows, you know, we can see that we don't have floodplain access. So as, we, as the discharge continues to increase above bankful flows, there's no relief in this channel. So it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And now we see that depth is a factor in this unit stream power equation. So the depth just keeps increasing as the discharge does, and that unit stream power keeps increasing accordingly. When you compare that with the C, with this nice, easily accessible floodplain, once you get above bank full discharge, the stream spills out onto the floodplain. As discharge continues to increase, the stream's actually getting wider much quicker than it's getting deeper. So, you know, we've sort of cut, cut off this depth factor in the equation here, and thus we've stopped this increase in unit stream power. Now, what a lot of people ask me after our conference is, well, why doesn't stream power plateau up here? You know, once we get above bankful discharge, our depth isn't decreasing. So why do we see this decrease in stream power? Now, I'm not an expert on, you know, uh, open channel flow or, or the, the details of, of hydraulics in a channel, but the way that I understand it is 
when you have bank full and below flows, you know, all the flow is contained within the channel and you have flow going this way, as you go into a meander bend, you have centrifugal force comes into the equation. And that creates these sort of these secondary circulation currents coming around the meanders. And these secondary circulation currents are very important in sediment transport. And ultimately, this is why pools don't get filled in with sediment after large flows, because they're worked through here. But you get above bankful and you get flow on the floodplain, that floodplain flow starts interacting with the channel flow. And so here you have floodplain flow dipping back into the channel and it's disrupting those secondary circulation currents. So that's why we see this drop in unit stream power in a stable C channel in greater than bank full flows. So, you know, coming back to this original screen, we can really see now that an F channel, you know, in a, in a valley setting where that's not the stable form is going to be much more sensitive to flood events because of this increasing unit stream power. And it's gonna be less resilient because after the flood, it's gonna have a lot of repairing to do. And that could take a very long time. As opposed to the C channel, where these flood events are not, you know, the, the channel is not as sensitive to the flood because of that floodplain access and that reduction in, in unit stream power. So that was some pretty heavy science, and I'm going to take like a five second break with a silly picture of our AWSMP staff uh, to, to refill my coffee here before we move into the, the next stage. So that was um, you know, a very quick rundown of where we see, where we get complexity in streams, where it comes from, and what it means, and you know, what these benefits are. And this is sort of really modern science. So we're, we're still in the process of learning, learning some of this stuff. But now let's step back and, and think about you know, how we think about streams and, and think about why we think about them that way. And it comes down to this, baseline of perception, you know, what do we perceive as a healthy stream? What do we perceive as a, nor as, a, as a normal stream, as a functioning stream, as a natural stream? But it's important to realize that humans have been modifying streams for a very, very, very long time. So in terms of what a, a really, truly natural stream is, um, it's a very tough question. This is a dam that's still functioning today. It was built 4,000 years ago in Syria, so 4,000 years. When I was sort of looking for these old examples, you know, this is coming from Wikipedia, but it did have some pretty good sources. I did check the citations at the bottom, but there's some evidence that the, the Nile River was channelized during construction of the Great Pyramids, so 6,000 years ago. We have the great inventor, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, who was who was drawing up flying machines and, and things like that during the Renaissance. And he was also scheming up ways to dredge rivers. So it's been a very long time since we've been messing with streams to sort of, uh, you know, have them do what we want or to be able to utilize them in the ways that we want. But what about, you know, so those are all sort of Middle East and, and European examples, but what about here in the, in the New World? Uh, you know, what's, what's our baseline of perception here? And, you know, we, at least I don't really know a lot about, you know, how the native populations might have modified rivers or, or to what extent. And I haven't really seen a lot of research on that. So in this region, or I guess, you know, in, in North America, our baseline of perception is really our oldest written records. And those are coming from the explorers and trappers, and sometimes the military personnel of the, of the 19th century, largely. So I'll give you a second to, to read these sort of accounts of streams from the, the early to late 19th century. And this is the wordiest uh, slide, so. <laughs> But what I'm hoping you, you take away from this slide is that it, uh, you know, streams seemed to be a lot messier. Uh, you know, you think about the Hudson River or even the Esopus Creek where we are, or 
you know, whatever your biggest stream is, the wall kill, the platter kill, uh, you know, whatever it is, if you saw a log, a log jam every 100 feet, you know, what would you think about that stream? Is that what you're seeing out when you're, when you're paddling or when you're hiking these streams? Not so much, uh, at least in my experience. Another thing to think about in terms of this idea of the baseline of perception is during that time, you know, that 19th century, there used to be many, many more beavers. And we basically decimated during them them during that time and they're now starting to to recover and come back so as many beavers as we have today and as much nuisance as they can sometimes create there used to be a lot more of them so you can assume that more beaver dams you know more down trees entering these channels so some canadian researchers kind of came to this conclusion that prior to european colonization of the americas Wood and streams was at least one to two orders of magnitude higher. So a lot of lot more wood in the channels than what we see today. But by 1900, you know, almost all of that wood was removed. And if you put yourself in this sort of colonial era, era context, you know, there were mill dams popping up everywhere. That was the main source of power. And if you had a, a log that came flying down the river during a flood, that was gonna mess up your dam, destroy your water wheel, you know, could really impact your well-being. So the wood was removed for that. And, and rivers were also the main transportation routes and, and log jams could be dangerous and impact transportation. So for 120 years at least, you know, we've largely been pulling wood out of these stream channels. So two, three generations of these largely woodless streams. And we see that today, or we, we see the, the effect of that today. Now, here's a, a paper published in a pretty well-respected peer-reviewed journal of freshwater ecology, published in 2019, talking about the benefits of wood in a channelized river system. And it's using this word debris. And you know, you look up that and, and you look up the synonyms of debris and it's garbage, it's junk, you know, it's ultimately something that shouldn't be there. And you know, you might be saying, okay, you know, this is semantics, what's the big deal? It's a word. Uh, but I, I hear this all the time, you know, part of my job is interacting with landowners and, and hearing about their problems with streams and trying to inform them of you know what the stream is trying to do. And I hear that dredging is cleaning and wood is debris, and that ultimately these, these features of messiness and these features of complexity are associated with, with being unhealthy. You know, they're bad things, and we as humans need to get in there and, and fix it because we love our rivers and streams, and our gut feeling is telling us that this messiness shouldn't be there. And you know, so what I'm saying here is that, you know, that might be because of the 120 years that of, of woodless streams that we've been seeing. <clears throat> and, you know, the, people aren't wrong when they're concerned about wood and streams. And a lot of us here, you know, we're probably river folks. We spend a lot of time on the streams. We're probably a little bit more accustomed to seeing wood accumulations and log jams and down trees. But for a lot of folks, you know, this is the only time that they're really going to see wood in streams. And these photos are really big deals. They're scary things. Uh, they're costly, expensive, dangerous things. So, you know, we really do need to talk about the, the risks of wood and messiness in streams as well. There's real risk, obviously, to the bridges and culverts, like we were saying, homes, people that live near streams, and also people that use the streams. And, and that's us as well as well as sort of the general public. Anyone that's boating or tubing, you know, we have a big tubing industry on the upper Sopus there, as well as swimmers and anglers. And out of all the pictures we've seen of, of wood in channels so far, this one is actually the most dangerous, this one sort of lowly down tree in a channel. And so now we're gonna talk about, you know, why, how did we determine that, that this was the messiest one or the most dangerous one, I guess. And this is where we come back to uh, Dr. Ellen Wall's paper on this framework of how do we, 
how do we manage wood and streams? And so now we're getting into this last part of the outline, you know, how do we inform stream management now that we know all this stuff that we know about streams? And how do we do it in a, in a responsible way and in, in an effective way? And so the way that we've been doing this has been using Dr. Wool's framework, and uh, it's sort of like a, a two-stage process. And so the first stage here is this rapid initial assessment, and it is legitimately four questions. If you answer yes to any one of those questions, you know, ultimately it's recommending that you remove the wood. If you get four no's, you know, why remove it? It's not a threat to reusers, it's not a threat to infrastructure but it could be providing a benefit, so it recommends retaining it. Now, <laughs> in our experience, you go out and you say, okay, well, uh, it's, it's kind of a threat to users or it's kind of a threat to infrastructure. So if there's any sort of questions or qualifications, basically uh, Dr. Wall's framework is saying, go to step two. Uh, so we'll get to that, but the one thing I do wanna say about this rapid initial assessment phase, especially if anyone's going to use this, is that we do recommend one change, um, you know, in these four questions. Rather than spanning the entire sort of active river channel, um, we've changed it to the active recreational channel. And that's where this one picture uh, comes into play, because it didn't span the entire channel, but it did span the Thalwag. And any tuber that was coming down the stream would have gone right into it. And, uh, you know, even a kayaker to go around it, it got real shallow. So it might not have been, been able to do that. So we recommend changing that to sort of this active recreational channel. Now, important slide here, because if anyone potentially wants to use this uh, method, the, the second stage is this decision band. And the idea is to get an interdisciplinary team together. And this is really, really, really important. Pull in your municipal officials, your resource managers, get representatives of the angling and boating communities, any nearby landowners, pull everybody together to do this. And I put Highway DBW staff in, in red here because you should really get them involved as well. Uh, not only do they often have a stake because of the bridges and culverts that might be threatened, but sometimes they have the equipment and ability to actually remove wood uh, because that can be really tricky. You know, who's responsible for removing it? And there's often no clear answer. But so anyways, you, you get your team together and you go through these 32 questions and those 32 questions get you to these sort of eight bands. You know, what are the risks to the ecosystem of removing the wood? What are the risks to users of, of if you keep the wood? And then what are sort of these other characteristics of the of the wood here? And especially I'd like to point out the stability and mobility. You know, is this wood likely to become mobilized or is it not? Because that plays a big role in the risk. So this gives a really good sort of quantitative, integrated, collaborative way of assessing this wood. And you know, that's how you're going to get buy-in from people to address it. You know, if it's something that does need to be removed, you're going to have a lot of different people in agreement saying that this needs to be removed. And hopefully that will help find somebody to actually get it out. Now, as an example of, of how we've used this, so we've used this method successfully for a few years now, and we've successfully removed some dangerous wood and some dangerous accumulations, and we've also successfully left some ecologically beneficial wood in the stream. And so just one quick example, in 2018, we got an email from somebody in Broad Street Hollow. There was some trees that had come down in a snowstorm recently, and it was backing up the wood, or backing up the water behind it. And, uh, you know, the person was really concerned about flooding and, and um, some other legitimate concerns. So we came out, you know, ran through our protocol. Um, we did go through the, de the decision ban phase because there were some questions in that initial phase. So we went through it all and decided to leave the wood. But the, the person that wrote this email, you know, when I, when I wrote back to them saying, you know, our assessment recommends leaving it, uh, it wasn't really what this person wanted to hear. That, you know, that didn't alleviate her fears of being trapped in this valley or of having the, her road to her house, you know, be inundated or destroyed or being cut off. And um, so, you know, I'll be honest, when I got this email, it really kind of hit me because I was 
it's like, oh, well, you know, I hope nobody gets hurt, but it's really, it's also not my responsibility to remove the wood. And that gets into a whole legal question of, of whose responsibility it is. But anyways, the, the point of this was a year later, I was going out monitoring this wood to see if anything had changed, I was taking some pictures and I ran into this person and was able to start a dialogue right there on site, looking at the accumulation. And so just like that decision ban, you know, when you're sitting there, standing there, walking around this site with folks, uh, it's, it can become a lot more clear as to, you know, what you're assessing or why did you come to a particular conclusion? And you also build this human, human to human, uh, you know, rapport, uh, which we're in a strange time right now is, you know, that might be a little difficult to do during, under these circumstances, um, but it's very important. I've since built a fairly good relationship with this person and, um, you know, we, we, we've had many long talks and, and a lot of email exchanges. And I, and I write, I put this on here because it, it leads us into, okay, well, where do we go from here? Uh, you know, I was able to sort of show this person that this wood accumulation wasn't increasing her flood risk. Uh, she, was, she was already at risk of being flooded. The wood, the wood wasn't causing it. And then, you know, I got her to understand that. But at the same time, I came to understand her concerns. You know, what was she actually concerned about? It wasn't so much the wood, uh, it was her property and her safety. And so that was a, a good lesson to me as well. But I put these here because the, you know, where we go from here is that we need to spread this information. And my job as a Cornell Cooperative Extension employee is to take evidence-based research coming out of academic institutions and make it useful for normal people. And I'm, you know, I consider myself so lucky to be in this job where I get paid to, to tell people about streams, but my wife and my friends will tell you that you know, when I clock out, I don't stop talking about streams. <laughs> uh, I can be a little annoying actually, but it's, they're just so fascinating and, and this, all of this about complexity and variety and messiness in streams is, is interesting and so I'm always telling people about it and that's changing people's perceptions you know we're, we're really starting to get to that baseline of perception and, and understand why we think the way we do and we can start to spread you know this good science it's not we're not spreading traditional stream management we're spreading good new science and good new stream management uh, you know objectives and I, I will say personally that I think words matter. Uh, so let's get rid of debris. You know, this isn't semantics. It's, it's a paradigm shift. Um, messiness is important. Wood belongs in streams. Uh, so the way that we talk about it is very important. And it's going to become more important in the future. Uh, our program, you know, we're involved with restoring degraded reaches, uh, you know, sections of river that have been dredged and straightened and all the wood's been removed. You know, river restoration is really aimed at, at re-naturalizing these areas. And additionally, you know, we're gonna have more wood. These forest pests that we have coming in, emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, as well as the reforestation of abandoned ag lands, we're gonna see more wood in streams in the future. So, you know, let's prepare for it now and let's get these management strategies in place. And you know, ultimately, let's keep spreading the word that, that messy streams are healthy streams. And that's, that's what we're finding out. And that will start this shift and um, you know, improve our stream management capabilities. And so I, I believe this presentation will be posted and available. So here's some of the uh, sources that I use. I would highly recommend the, the Patra and the Wormleton papers if you're interested in that uh, hydraulic flow through meanders and that unit stream power. Really great papers. And, uh, and anything by Rosgen as well in terms of the streams and, and obviously the Dr. Wall paper. And there's links throughout the presentation. So hopefully you can access those if you want. And I wanna thank you for, for listening to me. And uh, I guess we'll open it up to questions and. Russell and Emily, I don't know how we want to handle that. But. Tim, I think you want to minimize your screen share and then Emily will uh, facilitate questions. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.
we, we got one question about uh, links and how to share some of the links that were in your talk, Tim. And I think probably the easiest way will be for me to email those out to everyone who signed up afterwards. So we can just compile all those and get them out to you so we don't have to worry about putting them in the, in the chat. Okay. Um, we have a question here. Do you have any recommendations on books, articles, et cetera, besides what you've shown on your slides to learn more about this and streams in general? To learn more about this and streams in general? There, uh, whew, there is a lot of good stuff out there. Um, you know, I don't have anything off the top of my head outside of the sort of the links that were shown. I guess my one recommendation, and especially if you are interested or involved in managing streams in any way or, or concerned about wood in streams, is that wallpaper 2016, the, the framework. Um, she does go into a lot of the, the, that baseline of perception and the cultural history around wood. So it's really interesting in, in that sort of context. She does provide all of the context. And, um, and then really reading into the details of this management framework. Fascinating read. And I see uh, Danny Davis has suggested Rivers in the Landscape by Ellen Wall as well. Yeah. Yeah. She, she has another book called uh, Disconnected Rivers that I haven't I have on my shelf, I'm waiting to read. I haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, but from what I have read, it seems like a, another fascinating and, and excellent resource. We've got another question about legal <laughs> responsibility, if you can speak any more to, uh, to that about managing streams. Yeah, so that's, it, it's really difficult. Um, you know, an analogy that somebody told me once that I, that I enjoyed was, you know, when you go hiking, like in the Adirondacks or in the Catskills in the Forest Preserve, uh, you know, there's not a guardrail or a handrail the entire way up a mountain. You are assuming some inherent risk when you go out into that area. And streams should be thought of really in the same way, um, that there is some inherent risk and you, you need to accept that before you go out on the river. Now, that being said, you know, some of these are very, very dangerous and should be removed but it's a difficult question as to whose responsibility it is. And, and at least to my experience, there is no clear answer. So what we say to people is that, you know, if you're a landowner and you have a, a stream, a wood accumulation that you're concerned about on your property, you know, you can go in there and you can sort of buck up that wood into three or four foot pieces and kind of send it downstream. Uh, you know, it, it won't really hurt anything. It's not big enough to get caught on anything. Now the issue is if you are going to be disturbing the bed or banks, you know, you need to get a permit. So what I would recommend is if somebody has some wood that they're interested in looking at or have questions about, uh, contact your local soil and water conservation district and they can often come out or um, someone from your DEC region. And it, hopefully at least they could tell you if you need a permit to get in there and, and clear this debris or, you know, whatever you want to do with it. But it's a, it, the legalities are tricky and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to like, <laughs> uh, you know, put any wrong information out there. Great. We've got a question outside of the New York City DEP protection area. So the Ashokan, outside of the Ashokan watershed, what are some ways for watershed groups to ensure streams are protected from being filled in or blocked? So what, what can watershed groups do? Uh, well, I, if you're talking about being like filled in by sediment or, or blocked by wood, you know, it's, it's important to remember that if the stream is doing something, it's because the stream wants to do that. <laughs> uh, so if it's, if it's depositing sediment uh, or if it's depositing wood, it's because you're probably in, a, in an aggradational area or your slope has changed. So you know, the stream is going to do what it wants to do based on the characteristics of the valley and the channel. So, um, you know, trying to fight against the stream is really counterproductive. Uh, so really what you want to do is, is manage it. You know, you're not going to stop wood from being deposited. You're not going to stop sediment from being deposited, especially in an aggradational reach. Uh, but what you want to do is, is like, is live with it. Um, and, you know, try to find that balance between reducing risk while letting the stream be a stream. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but 
you know, you're not going to stop a, a stream getting filled in if you have excess sediment. Uh, so, you know, um, <laughs> by human development, I see. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's looking at the channel. You really have to understand the stream. So the best idea, if you have any questions that you don't know, you know, you can contact me or contact your soil and water conservation district. And those will really be your, your local sort of experts that can that can look at it on a site by site basis. And I'll note that uh, Brian Drum suggests Googling NYS DEC Woody Debris for information on removal and permitting requirements. If, if those of you out there still have questions on permitting, uh, Brian is apologizing that it still says debris. So yeah, and I'll also uh, our program as well has also put out like a similar fact sheet. So if you're you know exploring the AWSNP website, uh, we also have a, a guide on you know how to manage uh, woody material in the stream. Then there's a question about how and on what timeline streams recover from disturbance and what indicators might be used to track recovery. Um, sorry, what was the last bit? Indicators of recovery? Is that mm -hmm. what it was? Okay. Um, wait, so sorry, could you repeat once more? <laughs> sure. Uh, how and on what timeline streams recover from disturbance and what indicators might be used to track that recovery? Yes, uh, so it really depends on the site, on the stream channel conditions, on the uh, watershed conditions upstream in terms of the time scale. Uh, you know, sometimes you can see drastic change very quickly and sometimes it's a much more, it's a much slower process. It definitely depends on if you get a flood. You know, if we get a flood next week, uh, things are going to be a lot different than we're looking at today. So it does really depend, it's a site to site uh, sort of, you know, issue. But in terms of recovery from a channel, especially in terms of like bank erosion and mass failure and, and mass wasting of hill slopes that we saw in some of those pictures, um, vegetation. Vegetation is just so important. And if you see, uh, or if you have a landslide that kind of comes down and a mass failure and you're, you're starting to see growth of especially woody vegetation, uh, that's a very good sign that that area has been stable long enough to allow, you know, a woody shrub or even a tree sapling to get established and then to grow for a few years. If that site was, was still actively adjusting or actively slumping, you know, you're not going to get that establishment of, of woody veg. And so that, that's probably one of the best ones is, is look for the vegetation. Ryan, I think I'd better jump in. Uh, it's 9.30. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, our speaker next month is going to be Brian Yellen from UMass Amherst talking about the sediment study work that a uh, consortium of academics and practitioners have been working on examining the fate of sediment that might be released from dams if there were a, a, a lot of dam removal taking place in the Hudson Valley, the impact on the Hudson River. So that's a very exciting presentation I'm looking forward to next month. Um, Tim, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Emily, uh, and those of us associated with the Watershed Alliance, thank everybody for attending today and thanks very much. We'll see you next month. Thank you.